Radio EcoShock. Dr. Olivier Boucher is Senior Research Scientist at the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique, the French National Centre for Scientific Research, the largest science agency in France. Olivier is head of the Institut Pierre-Simon Laplace Climate Modeling Centre in Paris, part of the French group releasing the new results. Olivier Boucher, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Hello. Can we assume 7 degrees C warming by 2100 is the worst-case scenario provided by the new generation of climate models? So we have a new generation of models, which we have used for a broad range of scenarios, from the most optimistic to uh, the most pessimistic. And then we get uh, yeah, a range of temperature change by the end of the century, relative to pre-industrial time, which is anywhere between 2 and 7. So 7 is indeed the most pessimistic outcome, but I wouldn't say it's sort of any likely outcome. I mean, it's really uh, the worst you can imagine with a a scenario that is also very extreme in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So if we continue with our present emissions, which are still rising, and we don't do anything about it really, then... Could we presume that is where we would be heading, 7 degrees C warming? No. First of all, uh, you're correct that uh, greenhouse gas emissions keep rising. They haven't leveled off yet. Uh, But nevertheless, we have started to do something. And as you know, there is a Paris Agreement. There is a number of pledges from the countries. We know they're insufficient. We know we we need to do more. We need to do it more quickly. But there is a range of initiatives, so not just government, but societies, cities, regions. So we are uh, on track to, to something that is less than seven. It's, it's difficult to estimate, of course, uh, because some of the pledges uh, in the Paris Agreement are a little bit vague. It's not clear. But I think UNFCCC assumes that or estimates that the current pledges and the sort of continued effort at, at the level where it is now in terms of mitigation would take us to maybe 3.5, 4 degree uh, warming by the end of the century, which is still too much. So we, we need to do more mitigation, uh, more reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Why are these results worse than previous forecasts by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change? Okay, we can only speak for, for the two models, the two French models which have been presented uh, this week. And uh, if you want a full comparison to the IPCC result from, from CIMI-5, of course, we, we'll have to wait for uh, the full range of models. It's about 20 models or maybe yeah, 20 modeling groups, maybe 30 models around the, around the world. So it's a bit too early to say. But for our model, the uh, temperature increased a little bit more than it was in the previous uh, version of the model. And for the second model, the one from Meteo France, the French uh, weather service, it's, uh, it's significantly more warming. It's, it's a little bit less than in our model, but it, it, it is significantly more. The reason for this, we, we started to, to investigate. Uh, as you know, the, there is a number of uh, feedback in the climate system. If we, we do perturb uh, the climate system with uh, increasing uh, greenhouse gases, so that leads to a warming, and there, are, there is a number of feedbacks that actually amplify or dampen uh, this initial warming. And in our model, what we observe is uh, the water vapor feedback that is a little bit stronger in the new model as compared to the previous one. So basically, the, the process is uh, in a warmer climate, uh, there's also more humidity, and water vapor in the atmosphere is actually a greenhouse gas itself, so that induces a bit more greenhouse effect and a bit more warming. So that's, that's the reason we observe. I've long thought that large or local regional events like the Russian heat wave of 2010 or the Indonesian peat fires of 1997-98 could stimulate the process of global warming, but the models more or less have to leave them out. Do the new models include so-called local phenomenon, like hurricanes even? So, yeah, of course, there is a range of local phenomena, and uh, the current generation of model doesn't rep- doesn't include uh, the full range of uh, such phenomena. So, you mentioned tropical cyclones. Uh, at the moment, we do not simulate tropical cyclone in this uh, climate models because a tropical cyclone is a relatively small size, small scale process. 
so we can have some sort of uh, a little bit of an embryon of, of uh, tropical cyclone, but it's not fully resolved by the model. So you need further, we call that downscaling. You need, you need a, a more regional model to, to better simulate a tropical cyclone, and that's what Metaphones did. Uh, in the, uh, with the, with the uh, modeling system. For, you, you also mentioned heat waves. Heat wave is something that is reasonably well, uh, simulated by the model because it's a relatively large scale, uh, phenomenon. So we can indeed simulate heat waves and we do observe an increase, uh, in heat wave frequency and heat wave intensity in the model, uh, of, um, I would say most of the continental areas. We want computer models to duplicate the key operations of the planet, and they're pretty complex. But in reality, we are changing those processes even as we study them, and and perhaps faster than we can study them. Perhaps we haven't included things like we've changed the rate of permafrost thaw, and so things start to move faster than we thought. So how can we uh, try and approach a moving target with climate models? Yes, you're right that uh, models are imperfect tools. Uh, they, they're far from perfect. They, they, they have a lot of uh, qualities. I mean, we, we observe that they reproduce a lot of the, uh, the, the observed climate, but they are tools. They are uh, limited, uh, and, and there are a number of things uh, that, are not repre- that are not represented in these models. So you, you, you mentioned permafrost. That's correct. Permafrost can melt. It's, it's already melting, and that can emit more, more CO2 and more methane in the atmosphere. So there is a whole scientific debate to know how big that additional feedback might be. And indeed, uh, it's not included in these climate models yet. Um, so usually, we, we try to include it in, in sort of a, in, in the post-analysis of our, cli- of, of our climate modeling. So uh, the IPCC will still try to include uh, this, this potential feedback into uh, their estimate of carbon budgets, which is basically how much carbon emissions, how much CO2 emissions uh, are left for a given target, like for the two-degree target. So what we do, we do our best. I mean, we keep in, improving the models, but yeah, we recognize that there's still a number of processes that uh, are not represented or not well enough represented. But models remain uh, a sort of uh, the best tool, or the only tool, I would say, to really investigate the future. And the other great enigma is the future of clouds in a hotter world. Do the new CMIP6 models assume changes in cloud formation as the Earth warms? Uh, again, I can only speak for, for our model. I mean, we haven't looked yet at the, at the other CMIP6 models. Uh, we do not, we, we've improved the representation of clouds quite a bit in our model in terms of physics. So we're working on the, phys- on the, clou- on the cloud physics. So we think we have a better representation of clouds. And we can see that when we compare the current climate with uh, observations, which have, we have a much better representation of different cloud regimes in different regions of the world. We, this hasn't turned into a very different cloud feedback. So, the, so clouds do change uh, uh, in the future, and they're responsible for both negative and positive feedback. But in our model, at least, that hasn't really changed the, the, the overall cloud feedback from the previous generation to, to this one. And when the models portray a possible future 7 degrees hotter as a global mean, what is the baseline used? Is that 7 degrees C above the year 2000 or above 1880 or what? Yeah, that's a good question because here we reported the changes relative to pre-industrial, uh, whereas the, the previous IPCC has provided range relative to present day, which I think at the time of the last report was something like 1981. 2010, so a 30-year period uh, around the present day, uh, whereas here we report uh, the changes relative to uh, pre-industrial because now we have the Paris Agreement, it sort of sets target relative to pre-industrial, so we thought that's, that's a better uh, measure of why we're heading. Uh, but again, I want to stress that we have a full range uh, of scenarios, and, and 7 degree is one end, but the other end is we, 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 still, we still have scenarios that are close to 2 degrees, so so the, the future is still quite open. It really depends on uh, what uh, emission trajectory will be on, and uh, trajectories that uh, reduce emissions right away to a substantial uh, amount on, uh, to, in order to achieve neutrality by 
2060 or 2080 at the uh, at the planetary scale, this can put us on a two-degree pathway, more or less. So for, for some time, we'll, we'll, we'll have additional warming. Uh, I mean, until 2040, whatever we do, we should expect more warming. But for the, the sort of second half of the century, it truly really depends on uh, emissions as, we, as they change now. Do you expect other countries to duplicate your results on the climate sensitivity? And why do you think France is leading in this? Yeah, we've been uh, quite early in the, in the CIMIP-6 process because we, ha- we, we had a very strong engineering team, so we were able to start the simulations quite early on, but also to have all the quality control of the data on the publication process that was streamlined, so we could, we could publish the data on the, uh, the, uh, on the Internet, on the web, quite rapidly after the simulations. So a number of, of uh, uh, models uh, will, will follow. I mean, there is now uh, maybe 10 models which are available, at least in part. I mean, our, our models have published far more data than, than the other models. But, yes, it's, it, it's following, and there will be hopefully uh, more and more data so we can really put our models in context of the, of the other models. We really need an ensemble of models to appreciate what's uh, robust in the model results, where we think the models are correct because they all say the same thing, and where there are more uncertainties. The model disagree, so uh, we have less, there's more uncertainty, we have less confidence in what the models say. Olivier, I would like to explore one of your other specialties, the role of particles in the air, the aerosols. Is there better handling of aerosols in Earth system models? Is that a factor in the newly released results that you have put out this week? No, I don't, I don't really think so. Um, aerosols are, are important. I mean, they, they, they're cooling the Earth system, and they, they've cooled the Earth system to some extent during the 20th century. For about two decades, there's been a shift in aerosol concentrations from uh, North America and Europe to, to Asia. So there's, there's less aerosols over this of a, of a developed world, more aerosols of a de- developing world. Uh, but altogether, the cooling effect hasn't really changed over the sort of last two or three decades. Uh, and into the future, there will be more and more air quality policies. We, we, we start to see air quality policies in, in China, for instance. So uh, by, I would say, 2040, uh, we expect the, the concentration of aerosols from anthropogenic emissions, right, from pollution, to decrease. So uh, and that was already the case uh, in, in, the, in the previous set of scenarios. So that doesn't really have an impact on the end of century. Uh, the end of century really depends on, on the, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions. I understand. But there is a debate about how much heat aerosols are covering up. That is, if aerosol pollution was cleaned up to its pre-industrial state, but with the greenhouse gases we have up there now... How much higher would the global mean temperature be? Would it be half a degree, a degree, less, more? Yes, that's, that's you're correct. Uh, aerosols have masked part of the uh, anthropogenic warming from greenhouse gases so far. Uh, unfortunately, it's very difficult to assess. I mean, greenhouse gases are easy. They're sort of well mixed. You can measure them to good accuracy. Uh, we know the uh, relative transfer in the atmosphere. We know how, uh, how to compute the the relative perturbation for aerosols is much more complicated. They vary all the time. They vary in space. They vary in time. Uh, they have complex uh, optical properties, chemical properties, physical properties. So it's very difficult to estimate the, the uh, relative effect. And, and in that respect, we haven't made a huge progress. We still think it's somewhere between half a watt to a watt or maybe more. So uh, if we were to clean up uh, anthropogenic emissions of aerosols or, or the uh, gas based precursors, then, okay, it would heat up anywhere between a few tenths of a degree, Celsius degree, of course, uh, uh, or uh, on, on one degree. But that's, that's hard to say. I mean, uh, there's nothing more to offer than, than uh, a range. All right. And if almost all aerosol pollution develops in the northern hemisphere, as it does, is the masking of heat energy greater there compared to the southern hemisphere? Can it be localized? Um, it's a bit more tricky. Of course, you expect a local effect. I mean, if they are resource, then they, they modify the amount of uh, solar radiation reaching the surface, so, so that has an effect. But uh, the results, so the climate system also sort of uh, 
Uh, there's a lot of mixing uh, in the atmosphere, including uh, sort of energy mixing, if you want. So you don't expect just a local response. You, you expect both a hemispheric response and also a global response. And it's true that there is a lot more anthropogenic aerosols in the northern hemisphere, uh, but aerosols also modify clouds, and this is a highly nonlinear effect, which is, it sort of saturates uh, uh, quickly. So even uh, less uh, emission of aerosols in the southern hemisphere can still modify the clouds substantially. So even the balance between southern hemisphere and northern hemisphere in terms of the aerosol impact, we don't quite know. Suppose an economic crash or some other factor brought industrial society to a standstill, even for a month or two. How long would it take for aerosols to disappear from the atmosphere, leading to a possible jump in warming? Okay, the aerosols would disappear pretty quickly, uh, about a week. That's roughly the lifetime in the atmosphere. After a, week, after a few days, after a week, they, get, uh, they either deposit at the surface or they get washed out by, by rain. So you could say a week to two weeks in dry regions, maybe. Uh, But the warming, the extra warming that you would expect from that would take a a longer time to materialize. And that's because the the climate system is a bit slow to respond because essentially because there is an ocean. So so the ocean has a bit, is sort of a big buffer in in terms of of energy. So it would still take a a few decades for that extra warming to, to materialize. In the past two months in the news, we saw large wildfires in Siberia, Alaska, famously in the Amazon, but also in Angola, and now smoking choke from fires in Indonesia. And these fires, they emit a lot of carbon, of course, as the wood releases the carbon, but they also release clouds of aerosols. Do we know the climate effect of recurring world fires, and is that included in the new models? Uh, I would say indirect, it's indirectly included in the model. You're right uh, that they, they emit a lot of aerosols, but these are smoke aerosols, which means uh, these aerosols are, are not only scattering solar radiation, but they're also absorbing solar radiation. So on balance, they don't have uh, much of a climate effect. It's a, it's a, it's a little bit of a uh, tug of war between the cooling and the warming effect, and altogether it's probably a relatively small effect. Then, you're right, they also emit CO2. Uh, As long as the fires balance uh, biomass growth from photosynthesis, I would say it doesn't really affect the CO2, uh, uh, the carbon cycle. But I think what is more worrying is when the fires are just the the consequences of deforestation. And that deforestation is is a... is a clear loss uh, of carbon from the vegetation into the atmosphere, and that contributes to increase uh, the CO2 concentration. And, and just to give you an idea, uh, about one-fourth one of uh, global CO2 emissions are due to deforestation and land-use changes, and three-quarters are from fossil fuels. So this is, it is a substantial amount, and fires contribute to that. But I would say uh, fires in the Amazon, in, in in Africa, in Indonesia, or even in Siberia, to some extent, I mean, they, they occur every year. Some of it is natural, some of it is due to human activities, but it's, it's, it's more a problem when it's uh, a consequence of deforestation. Well, if the climate becomes even more destabilized, humans will be desperate for cooling solutions. I noticed in March 2019 you presented a seminar called Solar Radiation Management Global or Regional, And I wonder, can we try to mount solar radiation just over the Arctic, say, to preserve the last of the sea ice or slow down permafrost thaw? Or or do the atmospheric currents take whatever we put up there and spread them much farther? Right. Um, So solar radiation management is a a pretty broad term uh, that refers to, to a range of techniques. Uh, in order to cool the, the earth artificially. So, so one option is the stratospheric aerosol. So we basically inject, uh, sulfur in the stratosphere in the, in the higher part of the, of the atmosphere. It's not that we do it. It's, it's just we do it on paper. Uh, and that, and, and by doing so, you, you sort of reflecting a, a higher amount of radiation back to space. This clearly will achieve a global cooling. It's, you cannot really uh, achieve a regional cooling with that because the, uh, basically the stratosphere, the, the, the atmospheric circulation in the stratosphere will redistribute you, you, the aerosol, any aerosol that you, you may put there. So you would just achieve a global cooling. Uh, okay, it's got all sorts of problems, but we think uh, it, 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 
just in terms of the climate physics, uh, it, it can work. I'm not saying we should do it, but uh, technically uh, it's something that could work. Uh, if you want just to cool the Arctic, then that's, that's very much, uh, that's not easy. That's, that's quite difficult. And you have to think of other te- techniques. And people have been talking about marine cloud brightening, which is much well proven in terms of climate physics. And also, probably not so easy to achieve. And then the Arctic, I mean, half of the year is in the dark. So yeah, making clouds more more reflective wouldn't help if there is no solar radiation to start with. Um, so targeting regional cooling is, I would say, much more difficult. One of the fears about geoengineering, like injecting particles into the stratosphere, is creating inadvertent changes to rainfall. Is that a legitimate concern? This is a legitimate concern, of course. Uh, if we inject uh, aerosols in the stratosphere, this will have a cooling effect, but this is not a constellation of global warming uh, in any case. I mean, the processes are different, the greenhouse, greenhouse effect and the cooling from aerosols are two different things. So there would still be some resulting changes in atmospheric circulation, in, in uh, precipitation regimes, so there would be some regions with less precipitation. We know that essentially from climate modeling. I mean, we do numerical experiments that, that show that. So it's a, it is a legitimate concern. But then the question is, what do you compare to? I mean, if you compare to uh, a pre-industrial, yes, it, it, there will be some changes in pre- precipitation. If you compare to a, a much uh, warmer uh, climate, uh, like we could be heading to, I mean, it's still... Uh, an, we still undecided, but that's still an option, uh, then you, you may still be better off uh, with uh, solar radiation management. But, as you said, there is a, there is a whole lot of other problems uh, in terms of how long you have to sustain it. You would have to sustain it for, like, centuries, probably, uh, and there is no guarantee that you can do that. Uh, it may also affect the ozone hole. Uh, it, so there's a whole range of consequences that uh, could also happen. Well, if humans don't get our act together and we keep on with a carbon-based civilization, is it possible that civilization would not survive without geoengineering? Um, Well, I think that even in a very warm climate, civilization would survive. It would badly survive, but it would survive. There would be all sorts of of conflicts and uh, migration and so on, but I don't think it's the end of civilization. That's, That's the first uh, remark. Uh, but if, if ever, and I don't, again, I don't think this is uh, uh, the, the most likely outcome. I think it's a pretty unlikely outcome, actually. If we're really heading to five or six degrees because we've done absolutely nothing uh, until 2080, then uh, I'm pretty sure that the temptation to use uh, solar radiation management techniques would be very high indeed. Yes, because I think some people will just focus on the very high end that you have presented and and think, well, this is a model of doom. Uh, There's nothing we can do. But you've presented there there is a range of things that we could still do to avoid that. Uh, Absolutely. uh, The the future is quite open, and we've got scenarios from 2 degree to 7 degree. Uh, the, the, The objective of scenarios is really to investigate, to span the possible range of futures to look at all of them. And, and they basically show that yeah, global warming for another two decades is sort of unavoidable. I mean, we'll have to adapt to uh, uh, some more global warming. But after 2040, it really depends on the scenario. It really depends on what, what we do now. Are you personally worried about the future? I tend to be optimistic, but that's just my sort of personal uh, way of, of being. Uh, but of course, there is something frightening in, in the climate projections that we, we can make. We know it's going to affect people, and we know it's going to affect vulnerable people more than rich people. Uh, so there is really a, a, a question here, yeah, how, how, how we do mitigate uh, greenhouse gas emissions. As we finish up here, Olivier, is there anything else that you would like to talk to us about? Well, no, I think, I think we had a very comprehensive uh, interview and, yeah, very good question. Uh, I, can, I can see you know the subject very well, so this is uh, quite interesting. All right. From France, we've been speaking with Dr. Olivier Boucher, Senior Research Scientist at the French National Centre for Scientific Research, or CNSR. You can find more links in my show blog at ecoshock.org. Olivier, thank you for finding the time to talk with us on Radio Ecoshock. Thank you. 
I'm Alex Smith reporting. Check out the Radio EcoShock website. We're at ecoshock.org.